Not pretty good. Sometimes there's an advantage to it because there's some significant effect of Good evening. How can the government possibly avoid major confrontations with organized labor in British Columbia? But first, here's Ted with the rundown. Tonight on Webster, will the government back down from Bill 19, the new labor code? Both labor and government are determined to go to the wall over the controversial labor code amendments. Where will the battle lead? Webster finds out the positions and strategies of both sides tonight. Later with Ken Giorgetti, president of the BC Federation of Labor. But first, live from Victoria, Lyle Hansen, Provincial Minister of Labor and Consumer Services. Good evening, Mr. Hansen. Good evening, Mr. Webster. Let me ask you the same question I asked you tonight when I'd only seen the bill for five minutes. When this legislation passes, does it mean that never again can there be a lengthy major strike in British Columbia because of Bill 19? Absolutely not, Jack. What do you mean, absolutely not? It means that government will determine at some point in time when the public's interest is, is uh, harmed to the point of where they feel they have to take action. I might also point out that the, uh, the, uh, that power has lined with uh, being given to government a number uh, for years, and, and they've used it very judiciously. No, but this time it's different. This time you have, a, you have got a stated set of conditions which give the Industrial Relation Commissioner unprecedented powers. Is that not still the fact, or have you changed the bill? Well, Jack, I, I, I'm sure you're aware that in the House, uh, when the opposition were uh, being concerned or mentioning concerns about the uh, uh, the powers that the commissioner had, that I gave my undertaking that we would seriously consider uh, those powers, and and that's what I'm in the process of doing. Why didn't you realize that in advance? The moment you gave a bureaucrat the power to impose his own 40-day cooling off periods by himself with all his other powers, and then later on the power to go to the government and say it's time to stop this one. Do you concede, therefore, that you made a mistake in the first drafting of the bill? Well, I, I don't think that it was a mistake, Jack, in that sense. The, the, the power still is there. We've, we've, we're considering uh, moving that level of power up to the elected people uh, that uh, are in effect accountable. You mean the cabinet? Uh, the cabinet and the legislature, if the legislature is but you're sitting. But go, you're going to take Peck's powers and he will then go through all his procedures presently in the bill and go to the cabinet and say it's time for a 40-day cooling off period. Uh, well, Jack, we're looking at several issues in, in Mr. Peck's powers and, and his discretionary right to make those decisions. And as when we've made a decision, of course, we will introduce uh, uh, or at least advise what those decisions are. I'm not. So therefore, you're conceding to me that you put in because of the reaction from Labour, and also you must have had some severe criticism from management that you're going to have to modify Peck's powers. Yes, I, I think that's uh, that's a fair thing to say. I don't think it was a mistake, Jack, in that sense. I think that that uh, being reasonable people and listening. Uh, the case was made that those powers, or some of those powers, should be delegated to the people who are electable, and they are accountable uh, as the uh, All right. No, I can understand that. But let's take it as it is in the bill now as I see it. In the final analysis, there is no room for compromise, is there? A union leader could now go in with his demands away out here, management are away out here, and they're not going to move. Because you, one way or another, through Peck or his reports to cabinets, can say we're going to have a final determination, public interest, back to work, and here's an imposed settlement. Well, Jack, you're making an assumption that government is... It's in the bill. And the, uh, the, the authority is there, but you're making an assumption that the government is going to walk in without uh, due consideration and, and knowing the... Uh, 
the wishes of the uh, people of British Columbia, as you, as you get, become very quickly aware of what their wishes are, uh, you're suggesting that those powers, because they are there, will, will be used without great discretion and, dra and great consideration. And oh, I, and Mr. Hanson, what, what else can I presume when I see what his powers are in the bill, and I'm as capable of reading as you are? But would you, would you concede this point, that the public interest will be used by the arbitrary powers of the act whenever any major, for instance, let's put it this way, last year's Hodgson report, and this is what Monroe put to me, could have been a fact finder's report which could have been imposed by the IRC under this new act. It could have been, Jack, that's correct, but uh, you're also making the assumption that it would have been. What, what other assumption can I make? Now, let me ask you something else. Would you concede with me as a social credit cabinet minister that it was your opinion that the old labor code had tilted the advantage to the unions? Well, we had felt there were some, there were some uh, changes brought in, I guess, in 1983 or 84, and we felt that the interpretation of some of those changes were not the stated intention of those changes. In other words, they the judicial decision as to them were not really what the changes, and we've we've tidied it, tidied up a number of those areas. Now, and they've balanced. You've balanced it more on the management side, but do management like the arbitrary power for them to be put at their at the union's request to a to a vote decided by a bureaucrat? Well, I think that that the support that I'm getting from management, uh, or at least the concern that I'm getting from the management side, has been mostly directed towards the powers of the commissioner. And as I said, I'm looking at that. Uh, I don't, you know, because it is there, uh, I think there was good evidence in the IWA strike that the government was not prepared to step in with a heavy hand uh, without a lot of consideration. Well, you couldn't, of course, because the House wasn't in session and you, you didn't have the authority to order back to work legislation at that time. Oh, but Jack, if that decision had been made, the House could have been brought back into session, I think somewhere after uh, mid-November. Okay. Now let's look at some of the things which I'm told interfere with collective bargaining. Can you spell out the new difficulties in collective bargaining which the unions will face? Uh, some provisions they've had for decades, like hot goods, insisting on union-made materials like union-made coveralls, they're now out the window. Well, Jack, uh, you know... <clears throat> is that correct? That's correct, but let me tell you the philosophy behind that. As an example, we feel that parties who are not party to the negotiation should not be influenced by the decisions that are made by two other parties. In other words, let me use the... the, uh, the small case of, of where there was a requirement for the, uh, the machines in the lunchroom to be union made and union serviced. That was a decision made by the employees and the employer. Freely the, bargained. Freely bargained. But the employees of the, of the organization that serviced the machines were coerced or forced into becoming union members if they wanted to, to, uh, uh, to uh, service those machines. So therefore it's your philosophy, and this would be no secret, no. that you don't want any compulsion on any, anybody other than certified union members to be forced to meet union conditions. Well, Jack, I think it's fair to say that, that the unions have every right, and I support that and would fight for it, to go and organize any uh, industry or corporation, and, and the rules are very clear. They have the right to go in there and organize that association. But I don't think it's fair to use the pressure of an agreement reached by a third party that those employees had no decision or no input into to be forced. That, of course, is why you've got to... Section 65 amended, which overrides those conditions. Is that not correct? Yes. Where, where an authority cannot give away powers which it owns, but it can be later collectively negotiated. Am I correct? No, that's not completely correct. That, that, was a, a, uh, that is a section that deals with the statutory power that are, are given to various uh, people across the province through uh, government uh, like statute. municipalities, for instance. Yes, 
But that was, again, not the intention, and I am looking very seriously at the wording in that to make sure that the intention is clear and that there is no chance for misinterpretation. By the way, that's, that, uh, my advice is that section does not say that. But again, if there's any question of the clarity of it, we're looking at the wording. Maybe you rushed the legislation too much without careful legal double-checking. Well, Jack, for my, uh, I'm inexperienced in the legislature about six months, but going back on the records and getting advice of other people, there hasn't been a major piece of legislation that has gone through the House without uh, looking at the wording and, and some amendments coming Just forward. a few other points now. There are two clear interpretations of double-breasting. Your people say that double-breasting is not really feasible, but uh, that equipment can be sold from a union to a new company and double breasting started. Was it not your intention to make it quite clear to the construction industry that double breasting of union and non-union companies would be permitted under this act? Absolutely not, Jack. The, 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 but perhaps the, you can spell out the conditions. In, for instance, if, if I sell my equipment to another company, the successor rights don't follow, do they? Jack, if you sell your equipment to another company, and that a company assumes your position in the workplace. Uh, and in fact, you've sold all of your assets to that company. They continue doing business with your customers, doing business in exactly the same manner as they were doing before. In all likelihood, a certification would follow. But uh, I, can s I can put some money into another company as long as I'm not in sole at the same operational control and start up a double-breasted company. Why shouldn't you be able to invest in another Oh, no, company? I'm not complaining. I'm only mentioning. When you talked about democracy in the workplace, however, many union officials, including Monroe, who was here the other day, said, where's the democracy if um, a member properly expelled from the union can keep his job in a union shop? Is that not, from the labor point of view at least, an attempt at union busting? Well, I think, Jack, if you read the act, it says for, for reasonable dissent, that can't happen. For the non determination is reasonable dissent, and the adjudication division of the new Industrial Relations Council will make that determination whether it's reasonable dissent or not. Is there, a, is there any restriction on the number of apprentices and trainees who can be hired from outside the closed shop system? Oh, yes, and there always has been, Jack. There's a, there's a requirement for journeyman uh, uh -huh. apprenticeship ratio. You're going to be very tough, though, still in your sections about primary picketing and no hot declarations and no secondary boycotts. It's not our intent to change the intent of the legislation, Jack. Now, one last question about Peck's powers. It's hypothetical, but put to me, and I must put it to you. I was accused of being a flack for you the other night <laughs> when I was interviewing Monroe, and I'm not a flack for anybody, even though this is my second last broadcast on this particular series of programs. I certainly would attest to that. Well, let me give you a, a, a photo of where I was. Peck has the power to fire where somebody disobeys his orders, has the power to discipline, has the power to make a ruling that a person has broken the act and subject to the employer's discipline, correct? Well, Peck doesn't have the power to fire. No, the, the employer the has employer the power. The employer has that power. That's it. I think that, uh, that more appropriately put, the employer has the right to take disciplinary action uh, on the disobedience of an order of the uh, Industrial Relations Good. Government. Well, let me put it, you've probably had that in the House, but my viewers haven't had it. Supposing 40 men go on a wildcat, totally illegal wildcat, come, out, come up in front of Peck, poor Peck, I keep using his name all the time, and he says, these men have broken my, my order. The employer can discipline. He can either fire all 40 or just fire the union leaders, couldn't he? But, Jack, Peck hasn't made an order at this point. When Peck makes an order, because that now, will happen on a wildcat walkout. Now, let, let, let me take that just a little further. If there is a wild, uh, wildcat walkout with 40 people, uh, Peck will make a determination if it is an illegal walkout and right. order them back to work if that's his determination. If they fail to obey that order to go back to work, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So it, the, the employer then can just fire the union people and bring the other ones back to work. He could, couldn't he? Oh, yes, he could, but I think that, that uh, we're also looking at some, uh, uh, some appeal procedure if the disciplinary action is, is uh, unreasonable. 
Whatever the benefits of the collective bargaining process, with which you've undoubtedly interfered quite some bit, is it not correct that every Labour dispute faces the ultimate threat of an override by Mr Peck or the Cabinet? Well, I think that, that every dispute always faced the, uh, the override of, uh, of the uh, Cabinet or the government. Uh, the 40-day cooling off period was always there. It was 90 days in the case of the public service, uh, which could have been imposed by myself or the, the cabinet. Uh, but yes, there is, there is that, uh, but it, it's always been there. It's, it's not new. Anyway, you're, you're looking at the powers, you're thinking perhaps of transferring the powers and modifying the legislation, but you're going to stay with the basic thrust of Bill 19, even if it does cause uneasiness about investment until you pass it. Jack, we sincerely, sincerely believe that if this legislation is put in place and everyone gives it a reasonable opportunity to work, it will be for the better of all of us. Well, to you, to the unions, and to the province of British Columbia, which has had God knows enough labor trouble, the very best to work, and thank you for appearing, Mr. Hanson. And Jack, best wishes to you and your retirement. I'll be back leading uh, something or other <laughs> <laughs> after the break. Sad, you see? Sad. Jack Monroe was in here calling this bill the demise of democracy, saying he didn't want to go to jail, but he'd go to jail if he had to. I'm paraphrasing his remarks. He says non compliance, and here is Ken Giorgetti of the BC Federation of Labour. Very simple question, and I shall be just as straightforward to you as I was to the minister. Is that your line too? We intend, uh, if Bill 19 continues in its present format, uh, Jack, to boycott the adjudicative and the dispute resolution branch. However, uh, in saying that, uh, we've completed our first phase of our program, and phase two is uh, going to be definitely uh, around the thrust of preventing Bill 19 from becoming law. All right, let me do the social credit bit. The people of British Columbia would welcome a system of powerful compulsion which would put the, prevent a major strike again, although it was quite interesting, Mr. Hansen changed his answer from the first time. Now he's kind of leaving loopholes for strikes. But the people of BC don't want strikes, nor do the union members, do they? Nor do the union leaders. Uh, the people that lose the most in strikes are our members. I saw through the IWA strike a number of uh, IWA members lose a lot of money, Jack. I saw Macmillan Bloedel post pretty healthy profits. I saw the forest industry saying they cut as many logs last year as they did the year before. So who really suffered as a result of that strike? Well, you tell me what's wrong with the bill. The bill... I mean, I'd like to know specifically so that I could go off the air tomorrow ranting and raving and saying this, that, and the next thing. We told the government quite clearly from the outset of their provincial tour, although uh, Mr. Van Der Zam candidly admits that he had someone else conducting an internal tour amongst management lawyers and management representatives well, or even before Mr. Hansen was going out. But the way the government should have gone with Bill 19 was to put forward measures that would facilitate better collective bargaining and better relations between unions and management. You don't do that by compulsion. You don't do that by interfering in collective bargaining matters that have already been decided upon. You don't do that by taking away closed shop rights. You don't do that by taking a fundamentalist, simplistic approach to very complex issues. And that's what the government's done. But surely it was time that the closed shop a uh, total hold on the construction industry was opened up a little bit. No. At least to bring in some non-union apprentices. The boss's son, for instance. But that's the case now. I don't know why they make such a big, big deal out of it. Uh, right now, as I understand it from the building trades, that if the employer wants to hire his son or daughter, they are generally allowed to do that, provided their son or daughter join the union and pay union dues. And what's wrong with a man like Peck, uh, who happens to be, in my opinion, a good choice for the job if he maintains the present powers, in having the right to say, before there's a major blow up, 40 day cooling off period, you won't strike until. Well, we don't feel that someone from the outside should come into the collective bargaining process and interfere with that, including the cabinet or the legislature. The way the parties resolve the dispute is in, in the manner and fashion which suits them. And if it happens to go to a dispute or a confrontation, of which about 5% of all collective bargaining does, 
then that has to happen that way. If you're forcing people to accept something that they don't want, then you're creating a bigger problem as a result than what you're solving. But you would, would you agree with me that the public are delighted to see the possibility that picketing in a legal strike, if one ever takes place again, is going to be restricted largely to the place of operation and nobody else can be dragged in? That's exactly why the IWA strike went as long as it did, Jack. And it was proven by Mac Blow's profit statements, is the IWA could not put economic pressure on the employer because of the restrictions put in during the 1983 amendments with the Bennett government. All we want is when we are on strike or when we do get locked out, the opposite to that is, uh, is this kind of legislation, is when the employer locks us out, does that mean we can go and work and draw a wage even though the employer locks us out? Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty chintzy of you, mind you, to complain about union contracts requiring union coveralls to be supplied to you or union vending machines. Surely that's pretty chintzy to complain about. Well, if you look at the process, though, it's the union and the employer agreeing Mm -hmm. to a set of rules and now the government is coming in saying there's only certain things you can bargain now it would be like the government interfering with the law society saying there's only certain things the law society can set down why what right does the government have to interfere in things that the employer has freely agreed to with his employees i forgot to ask him if the uh, ability to pay applied to uh, private companies i don't think it does apparently it doesn't uh, again uh, it was an interesting point that mr hansen made that they made some changes through bill 19 because the intent of the changes on the bennett uh, changes in 83 weren't administered and interpreted properly by the uh, the labor board and the courts but now they're saying that the law says one thing but their intention is another and they know full well, well whatever they intend makes no difference once the law is passed. It matters what the words So mean. you would say it's a badly drafted, hastily prepared law with lots of um, ambiguity in it. I don't say it's, I say it was a well-crafted, well-thought-out document by some very anti-union people. And it's, uh, it come, we've come to the conclusion that that piece of legislation was drafted and finished well before Mr. Hansen concluded his... So work. therefore the free collective, we, we've never had free collective bargaining since the Labor Court or the Mediation Commission, have we? Well, we've had essentially non-interventionist collective bargaining by any outside parties. And so what's so now. different about this? Is it merely the fact that PEC can interfere and impose a solution? Well, you said it when you talked to the Minister of Labour. What reason would any negotiator have to modify or to go through the collective bargaining process when they know full well that Mr. Peck or a cabinet or the legislature might or will possibly interfere and impose something upon them? What's the motivation to bargain, to knock your, your packages down to a workable is there solution? Any, is there anything in this bill which you can say is a deliberate attempt to begin the smashing of the trade unions in British Columbia? Oh, there's a number of things. Uh, the interference uh, contained in Part 8, which is the powers of the commissioner, uh, the ability to hire apprentices, uh, the statutory overrides, the uh, not allowing us uh, to issue boycotts, of which we do with much prudence and diligence. You can still do them when it's propaganda only. It's propaganda only, but uh, the fact that our members can't negotiate freely with their employer the right to not handle Gainer's products, for example. When Mr. Pocklington hired those scabs to produce out of that uh, packing house in Edmonton, our members should have the right, if they negotiate with their employer, not to handle those goods, to not handle them. What right does the government have to interfere in that process? Because the government believes the public interest is paramount and that it doesn't want the strike to affect the economy of people not directly involved in the dispute, with which many people might well agree out there in the great television land. But my, uh, my sense of it is that the public agrees that the best way to resolve a problem is for the parties to work it out themselves, not for the government to legislate compulsion and le legislate unnecessary rules and restrictions on a process that virtually works mm -hmm. confrontationally free. I gave Mr. Hansen more than a double settled uh, um, segment, so I'm going to continue with Ken Giorgetti for a little while yet and take your telephone calls on Bill 19. to Ken Giorgetti of the BC Federation of Labour. It does look as if uh, Mr. Hansen is planning some modification to the position of Peck in relation to the cabinet and his own independent actions. Did you get that message? Well, I, I, it appears that he's reviewing that section. And uh, again, that was the only section that the Business Council complained about as I uh, 
I heard Mr. Matkin is they were nervous about the uh, the powers given to the commissioner and because um, they can be forced to go to a vote before they have I mean you all go into your negotiations Gandhi dancing don't you yes you're out here at a dollar and a half increase and they're out here at a dollar and a half cut now if you your position now will be I presume in some unions just to stick there of course you have to because you don't you might be it might be imposed upon you it might go to a final offer selection you have to take that position to a vote of your membership on the employers final offer so the employer's final offer might be nowhere near what they would have offered if you'd gone through the usual procedure of agreeing on this, 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 sure. and then arbitrating on that. Sure. And Could it not bring labor peace, though, if it's properly administered, this act? I don't see how, Jack, because people have to, when you go into a collective bargaining setting or any other interaction, is you have to feel, uh, in order to be productive and cooperational, you have to feel, feel as if you have equal footing. And this bill gives us a sense, a very distinct sense, that the, uh, the scales are tipped heavily in our disadvantage. Mind you, they were us. tipped quite heavily the other way in some of the old Labour Board decisions about successor rights. I don't agree. I don't think so. I mean, when that bill was passed in 1973 to create the Labour Code, it was voted upon unanimously by the parties. But that wasn't the key to it. The key uh -huh. to it was business and Labour said, we'll make it work. And they did. Yeah, but then you got silly successor rights, like an empty building taking successor rights for a union. I, I don't know where's that, where that's happened. Thrifty, I've heard that, thrifty that and case Safeway is, in Victoria. And that case is still pending, and I, I'm not sure that the fact pattern would support that assertion. But if there's a bad decision on a piece of law, administering a piece of law, I don't think you should change the law. I should, think you should change the people administering the But on the, the picketing, you and I know perfectly well that in these multiple plant areas, one union is on strike, and the other unions not affected, they're effectively closed down. This is going to avoid that. Only the union that's on strike will be on strike. Only sometimes will it avoid that, and, and for the most part, that doesn't happen. For the most part, the unions all in one shop bargain at the same time and, and get together, and, and don't, that doesn't happen. To put those kind of restrictions on, though, mm -hmm. Jack, will definitely favor the employer because they will pull the parties apart and make sure that one party never bargains at the same time as the other. So. Old Vaughan Palmer says in Victoria, the system takes away the ultimate responsibility from labor and management and removes the incentive to compromise. That's right. And why wouldn't labor fight the process every step of the way, given that it views the deck as being stacked in favor of management? But you are a very, you're a different kind of BC Fed leader. You seem moderate, low key. Does that mean all your reactions are going to be moderate, jajetti, low key? Well, I don't think so. Um, I'll let uh, my adversaries underestimate me all they want. We, uh, we have finished our first phase of the program of action, which is uh, public meetings. Uh, we finished that last night in Castlegar, and now we're moving into our phase two strategy, which is uh, looking at uh, methods that are more traditional to the trade union movement to oppose God, uh, Bill 19. With 13 percent unemployment, who needs confrontation? Exactly. That's why we played our cards uh, straight up, Jack. And uh, when this thing happened, and we believed the Premier, he wanted to end confrontation, we sat down with the business community. Do you think the Premier planned this knowing the confrontation would happen? Or do you think that he's simple-minded enough politically to believe that this would be accepted by the labor movement? Well, I don't, uh, I don't profess to uh, be able to interpret or understand how the Premier thinks, but I do know that he admitted uh, publicly that he had one of his administrators or one of his assistants out discussing during the IWA dispute on what management and management lawyers wanted to see changed in that labor code. I so think, I think, uh, I think, I think there that was, was some a problem going on. That with the best will in the world, Mr. Van der Zam thought with his charm he could solve that complicated dispute and found, to his dismay, that the only way to solve that was with compulsion. But all that does is stall the problem. If you force people to live with something that they don't like, all you do is let the problem fester for a period of time until they get back at it again. Yeah, you could roll over and play that for the sake of labor peace. Go ahead, please. Uh, Mr. Giorgetti, I have a copy of the bill in front of me, and I've got two that I'd like you to really address. And one is Section 31. It's 55-1 about professional strike breakers being entitled to vote on a settlement. Yep. And the second one is Section 36 of the new bill, which is an amendment to Section 66, which reads where an employer has not employed a person or as an employee in a unit for a period of two years, any collective agreement applicable to that unit shall be deemed to be terminated upon the expiry of the two-year period. 
And I bring that up in regards to the Sladen-Stewart dispute, which has been going on in this city and in the interior for the last three years. Under this legislation, all those people that have been out on that picket line for three years, there is now no longer a collective agreement in place, and those people are SOL. Which section is that? That's section 36. It's on page 11 of the, the bill, Bill the 19. Yeah, the men's section 66. Oh, yes. When an employer does not employ the person as an employee in the unit for a period of two years. And a Any collective agreement applicable. Are you telling me, do you agree that this is a, where a strike lasts two years, it's finished and done and gone? It's conceivably uh, uh, able to interpret, be interpreted that way. Further, there's other examples where unionized companies will move to Alberta for a period of two years and then come back uh, not having to face their obligation uh, of the collective agreement. Mind you, wouldn't you have some sympathy for some of these contractors of whom hundreds went bankrupt under union condition that after two years they should be allowed to start again non-union? Well, I don't think they went bankrupt because of union conditions. They went bankrupt because the economy went down. And uh, surely to God, the uh, fair-minded people can't blame the union movement for the bad economy. We don't set the economic policies in this country. But I want to go back to the first part of his question, and that's quite true, and I believe John Bajan addressed that. Is that if you've got a, a unit of 25 people that are on strike, and the company hires 25 strike breakers, what we call scabs, when there's a ratification vote now under this law, those scabs are entitled to vote on the ratification of that package. And as John Bajan said, it doesn't take a clairvoyant to figure out how those 25 scabs are going to vote, because if the contract's accepted, they lose their job. That is an historic uh, union position in British Columbia, that scabs, that you negotiate the scabs out before you go back to work. Well, of course, and Quebec has that legislation that they can't hire strike breakers, and strikes, the frequency and duration of strikes has gone down as a result statistically. My caller was wrong on one thing. He talked about professional strike breakers. That applied, as far as I was concerned, only to the possibility of running a newspaper plant by bringing in professional strike breakers from the Northwest at one time. More questions to Giorgetti after the break. Well, kids are after, but they adults be ignoring. Finally, Chief Whip. Go ahead. Hi there. Good afternoon, gents. Yep. Hi. I'm an organizer in one of the, a union organizer in one of the few growth industries in this province today in the private sector. Uh -huh. And I want to point out what uh, the new act will do to organizing. Mr. Hansen earlier on said uh, the unions can feel free to go ahead and keep organizing. Well, in 90% of the cases of applications being made today in our industry, uh, employers go ahead and break the code in terms of uh, Section 33A of the code and uh, will make promises to employees and, and try to discourage the employees from supporting the union and particularly to change their minds about supporting the union prior to the vote. Uh, what the new act will now allow is for the employer to simply come out and say anything he wants to those employees, regardless of whether or not he wants to follow through on that. Uh, naturally, the employees uh, will feel they're going to get a good deal from the guy. They're going to change their minds, vote no. When the union has to walk away, uh, the employer cleans house and he can't take the next step. Uh... Okay, let me put it the other way. The employers have said traditionally that when the plant was under organization, they were forbidden on pain of death to speak to the people in the plant. Is not pain correct? of death, not they're, by any means. No, no, they were, you know they what were I mean. restricted from, from uh, speaking out uh, relative to the, organ the employees considering organizing because that's a private affair. The employees themselves have to make the decision as to whether or not they want to unionize. And we don't think that the employer has a right to put forward their views on whether or not they should organize. He That's a had, private decision. He now, the employer now has been given that right the moment he hears of an organizer around to propagandize and talk to his own employees. Could call them all in the lunchroom and say, look, I want to talk to you about unionizing. We That's saw what case. happened. And in, uh, in the very near future, union organizers will be an extinct species. Well, you're in the high-tech industry, obviously. No, in uh, uh, food, beverage, and accommodation services. And you object to this bitterly. You bet. But, uh, you know, I mean, yes. I can always uh, go back to my trade. You know, okay. that, that's not a serious problem. Not I mean, sure. I can... I, you I made the point. You made the point. Go ahead, please. Uh, concerning the issue of apprentices working for their father's companies, I, I thought I heard Mr. Giorgetti say that this uh, was not true. That is, that uh, apprentices were allowed to work for their father's companies. And that is absolutely untrue. Uh, I was in the contracting business for 30 years. I have three sons. 
uh, the unions even had control of the apprenticeship schools. They couldn't get the boys into the school that was paid for by the government. The boys were never allowed to work for my company. Okay, what do you say to that, Ken? Well, it's my understanding that if an employer, a contractor, wants to hire their son or daughter, and of course, there's no one in the training program that has rights to finish their training program. There might be times when that program's filled up. But if there's anyone that contributes more to the apprenticeship training program than the building trades in British Columbia, I'd like to know who that is. They participate fully, and they're, yeah. in fact, the ones well, that set the ratios. I've got to tell you, Ken, what the man says is right. Much obliged. Thank you. A number of complaints I've had over the years myself. Mind you, I've had complaints on every conceivable subject yes. under the world. Go ahead, please. Uh, yes, hello, Jack. Mr. Giorgetti, I'd like to make a couple of points. Number one, in order to have industrial harmony in the province, the Act has to reflect impartiality and balance. Going back to 83, the changes at that time, two well-respected former board chairmen, Mr. Paul Weiler and Mr. Don Monroe, made the observation at that time that the scales of balance were tipped too much in favor of the employer. Mr. Bajant, on your program a week or so again, Jack, said the scales of, of justice have been toppled right over into the employer's lap. I disagree with when you say, Jack, that Mr. Hansen is an excellent man for the job. I didn't say that! And, and I'll tell you why. I think perhaps he could have Did been... Did you say that? No, I didn't that say legislation, that. legislation, Jack. Jack, just yeah. hang on. Just a minute. I did not say Hansen was an excellent man for the job. Settle back, Jack. That legislation no, was written... I said Peck. Okay. That legislation was written by Mr. Van Der Zandt who is an intolerant man who believes because he's got the numbers in the House, he can pass whatever legislation he wants. And then when people see that it's not fair and start to rebel, he says, as regards to the teachers, uh, you're not professional. And in regards to the trade union people, you're not good British Columbians. OK, boy, made a good point. I do think that Mr. Van der Zandt may be slightly unsophisticated, to put it mildly, in his knowledge of the labor climate and the possibilities of confrontation in British Columbia. And that's about as modest as you would put it yourself, isn't it? Well, One I'd be call. a little stronger with it, but... Uh, well, uh, you know. Go ahead, please. Yeah, I'd like to uh, know what security is going to be uh, given on this Bill 19 to union and non-union tradesmen. Like Kirkhoff is getting the chips now, and plus the gravy. Okay, you just got time to answer that one. Well, th there's no security to anyone in terms of their rights uh, to freely associate uh, into a trade union or not to freely associate into a trade union. The problem with the, the whole bill is it won't create industrial relations stability. We are prepared to accept that there has to be industrial relations stability in British Columbia. We think it's already there, mm -hmm. but this will create turmoil. And for that, and we're seeing the articles appearing in the Financial Post, the Wall Street Journal, that BC's in for a rough ride, and they're right. And if this premier and this government's interested in creating jobs, full-time, long-term jobs, then they'll create industrial relations stability. And I only have to go back to the way Mr. King, when he was the Minister of Labor, administered that code as he got consultation going, he got the parties to agree to make it work, and it went through the House unanimously. All right, your hero, Mr. King, said it's war. Do you agree? Well, we're getting very impatient trying to... Uh, convince the Premier in a logical way that we're upset and there has to be changes made to Bill 19 and if he forces us uh, into a confrontation, which I think he wants us to do, um, it'll be his fault and the fault of the bill, not ours. My thanks to Ken Giorgetti, BC Federation, President of the BC Federation of Labour. Thank you. Thank I you. hope the whole damn thing gets smoothed out in short order with compromise and reason if it's there at all on both sides. I'll be back after the break. Why did we all go into newspapers? Was, uh, was it because you started first or because it was uh, because wanted us not to go into the well that did This in fact is uh, one of my choices for an edited best of Webster. Three Webster boys on Fleet Street at one time. Sandy, my older brother now dead, yours truly, gonna be semi retired. And my younger brother, Drew, retired. Webster boys. Why did we all go into newspapers? Was, uh, was it because you started first or because... It was uh, because... Mother wanted us not to go into the... 
<laughs> well, Dad didn't want us to be engineers, and uh, I wanted to be a journalist. That was the only thing I ever wanted to be. And my school teacher had been to university uh, with Sir Robert Bruce Ed to the Glasgow Hill, and that's how I got in. You got in as you an follow. office boy. I got in as a gummer. I took the, the tape as it came off the creed machines uh, and sent it forward to the editorial. That was my beginning. I followed and then you followed. And I followed you at the Daily Mail in Glasgow, indeed, and I had the first job of bringing the call in. What I wanted to say about the old dad was that I admired his, the fact that he was a precision engineer. <coughs> and I'm, I'm surprised that none of us seems to have inherited that. My daughter has. What about your kids? None of my kids. My daughter Lynn can put together little bits and pieces and Jack repair things. Like Jack, that. who met uh, our father, said, says on a number of occasions, near enough is no good enough. Yes. yes. That was the message he left behind. One thing I liked about him was that he always wore, wore a bowler hat as a foreman so that he was easily identifiable by the guy having a quick cigarette. In Inverary, Scotland, the other day, a man walks up to me and says, you're Jack Webster. He was from Toronto, Canada. I said, yes. He says, I served my time with your father. Mm. Anywho, well, there was one time when I think all of us uh, were working on Fleet Street at the same time, correct? That's, that's right. I was in the old News Chronicle in Bouverie Street. Where were you, Drew? I was at the House of Commons working for another organisation. And I was the uh, night news editor of the old dreadful yeah. daily graphic sketch thing. Yeah, I remember that. Isn't it kind of sad about Fleet Street? Is it finished down the tube, gone forever? Well, uh, the jungle looks fiercer and worse than ever, but really the prospects are quite good. As your old friend uh, Roy Thompson used to say, old friend be damned, but I trouble know what with Fleet Street is that it's got too many newspapers. <laughs> <laughs> but the fact that, in spite of all their difficulties, they all survive the Mail, the Express, the Mirror, the Sun, a new paper called the Star, and then the Heavies, the Guardian, the Telegraph, and the Times, it's quite fantastic. And uh, <clears throat> the provincial press uh, persists as well. But these days, the economic situation of the country means that all of us are in grave trouble. And, as you know, Jack, across the road from this office stands the deserted building where, not so long ago, the London Evening News was published. One of the great London newspapers. And, of course, when we were boys in Glasgow, there were three evening papers, the Times, News and Citizen. Not so long ago in London, there were three evening papers, the Star, News and Standard. And now there's one called the New Standard. It's Sandy, rather sad. Sandy. I think Brother Drew has been anglified and is a solid member of the... Wait a minute, get your syntax right. Anglicized. <laughs> Anglicized, anglified, and is a proper member of the establishment. I'm sure that when you come to tell me the death of the newspapers, you'll give me, and there have been many die, you'll give me a much more different reason. I'll give you very different reasons. I'll give you the reasons I left journalism in 1974 at the young age of 59. We were taken over by a London mob, and the first thing they, they wanted to do was put nudies, what we call tit and bum on page three. I believe you call it T and A. Correct. That's right. Well, I wouldn't have it. I'm an old Calvinist. And I said, no, make me an offer I can't refuse. That paper has gone on from strength to strength. <laughs> Nobody takes the slightest notice of me. But I still think I was right. Future newspapers, well, myself, now that I'm really a lay person, I get most of my information from radio or television. Superficial, of course. You can't get the same depth as you can get from a good newspaper. I don't know. I think that's just a slick remark. Some of the in-depth stuff we have on television is first class. I've got to tell my little story about taking the picture of the guy, stealing the picture off the wall of the guy uh, in the gang fight. And on the Monday morning, the three heavy brothers came to get me. I sent to, to the art department for the picture, and it had been totally ruined by Indian ink. <laughs> and I had to get Harold Bishop Dixon, a dreadful man, to give five pound to the family. Now. We had a good upbringing. You know, I got so angry the other day when one guy talked about our 93 Battlefield Avenue. I said, I've been back shooting our roots, 93 Battlefield Avenue. He <coughs> said, why would you want to take a picture of that to show everybody in Canada? Respond. Well, it's a perfectly respectable house. I mean, he obviously thought it was some kind of a slum. No, no, I'm talking about the kind of lifestyle we had when we were kids. Perfectly good upbringing, yes. Yes, we all had to work hard. Some of us had to go with milk in the morning. And I was rather a sensitive child. And I cried my way to the milk shop. Whereas my brother, on the left, made a giant killing at Christmas with the tips. New I, Year. I, I New knew, Year. I, I New Year. I knew he was going to be a millionaire. 
Well, those were the good old days. I loved delivering milk in the morning and papers in the afternoon and having my little private rake, it used to say, of spare rolls out of the basket sold at a lesser price. May I recall for the benefit of our Canadian fans and Sandy and I both have fans there. Yes, it's yes. not a fact that somebody rang you during a talk show and said, go home, Jack, stay Sandy. That's right. I'm very proud of that. And I love the lady in Vancouver who rang me twice in ten years and said, Drew, you sound just like Ronald Coleman. <laughs> Ronald, who? <laughs> but we were talking about um, something else, weren't we? We were talking about uh, Glasgow. Talking about reporting, we were talking about family. Yeah. Uh, now, each of you, you are both good talkers on the Wild Colonial Boy. Where did we get all this talking ability, this well, extrovertish uh, attitude? Uh, well, I would think Grandpa Spot, who was a dapper little baker who drank too much, but was very good with the horses. And he used to have a lovely little moustache wavy hair, brown boots, which killed him, he had bunions. So after he'd had his dinner or tea at night, he would take his boots off, take his socks off, get a basin of hot water, put into it a pearl button, and sit there and steep his feet. But he was a little show-off. Why the pearl button? Well, say it gave off something chemically. Mm. I remember sitting on the arm of Grandpa Spot's chair at King's Park, listening to the distant sound of uh, an Irish radio station giving the tips for the horses and my job was to write down the tips so they could go down the bookies in the morning is it true about the night grandpa's part died yes it's quite true q sandy well uh, as the mist came over his eyes he must have remembered that he had backed uh three dogs dog racing three dogs in what we call a roll-up if the first one wins goes in the second and he asked for his favorite paper the sunday mail to check <coughs> whether he had won he hadn't. He sighed and died. A likely story. <laughs> Do you remember Grandpa Webster, the old man? Yes, with the, with the toupee, the transformation. Do you remember him going out of the room looking perfectly well and young, and he would come back, and we, the three kids, would think, something wrong with Grandpa Webster, something wrong with Grandpa Webster, and he'd taken off his transfer transformation. Yes. That's right. Do you remember the little sign, the little, uh, little thing on the wall? When the heart is young and sporty, life begins at 40. <laughs> Talking of signs, <laughs> I remember a little cameo in our own house at Battlefield Avenue when, if guests were staying late, <laughs> my father would obtain from the sideboard a large notice which said, please move. This was a notice that was in use in the engineering works for moving machinery. <laughs> so he would put it up the mantelpiece. On other occasions, he would retire behind the couch and pretend to begin to undress the bed. <laughs> yes, but I have a, a, a nice memories of Grandpa Webster because he was one of the pioneers. He went to Venezuela uh, as a tin miner. And in the old days, when you came off the boat, the first thing to do they did to you was measure you for your coffin. <laughs> I've got some questions for you. Question. If I was an unemployed uh, mechanic living in Sheffield today, yeah. would I be welcomed in Canada? The Canadians would welcome you. You would find it very difficult to get in unless you got more than 50 points. Our immigration policy towards the Brits is kind of tough at the moment, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. But it's a great country. And you're great brothers. And uh, do give my love to all of the Websters everywhere. And this, of course, is Sandy, the London editor of the... United Newspapers, Drew, uh, London editor of United Newspapers, the ineffable Sandy, starting in his career, and I'm Webster. And I'm still Webster. Tomorrow is my final program of this Webster series for nine years. If you miss it, you're stupid. At 4.30 p.m. precisely. <laughs> Well, that was my nostalgia for the week. It's quite incredible, three Webster boys on Fleet Street all at the same time, when it was, and now again, of course, it's a very vital place. The cake lady was in again with another cake. We've got to show it to you. Don't miss tomorrow's special program beginning at 4.30 p.m. precisely.